Jump on in here. Okay. Let's see, we got some parents jumping on. Hi, parents. Thanks for hopping on with us. We'll give it a couple more minutes before we get rolling. Um, I'll say it a couple of times, and you'll probably see me type it in the uh, chat there that uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to type those out. And you don't have to wait till the end to type them as they come to you. Maybe something that Todd says triggers a question for you. Just go ahead and send it, and we'll, we'll save it at the end. Uh, and we'll go over those questions. But thanks for hopping on here. All right, well, it's five o'clock, so I want to definitely respect our time, and uh, and I appreciate, I'll introduce to you parents, this is Todd, me, Todd, uh, I met Todd through uh, Planting Seeds. For those of you that were with us last webinar, um, we had a couple of therapists from uh, Planting Seeds, and so obviously that's a, a practice that I really like and I recommend to a lot of people, um, but Todd is with, with Planting Seeds, he's also a uh, uh, a minister uh, in a church. He's been a youth pastor. Uh, he's done a lot of work in church work and also as a therapist. And so I'll let him kind of give all of his background. But Todd, I appreciate you coming on here and, and being with us and spending some time with us this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Father, thank you for this evening. I uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together as parents and to uh, talk about a tough topic. Uh, but it's a topic that we need to address because it's a topic that our kids are facing. Um, God, it's it's sadly it's it's not a it's not a if it's more of a of a win situation. And so I pray that you would help us as parents, God, that you would equip us to know how to have these conversations and uh, Father, how to love our kids well. Thank you for Todd and his ministry, and how he helps the local church, God, and and also how he helps the community through his counseling practice. And I, I just pray you bless him in this time and speak powerfully through him. And God, just uh, I pray that as we walk away from this, that we could have uh, tools in our tool belt as parents uh, to know what to do and what not to do, what to say, what not to say, and just be very aware of your spirit uh, in, in, in leading us as moms and dads. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, Todd, take it away. Hey, thanks, Jimmy. Well, hey, guys, good evening. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to spend a little time with you this evening um, man, and as Jimmy said, talking about a, a topic that sometimes is a little uncomfortable for people to talk about, but is such an important topic, uh, especially around our, our teenagers. So uh, as Jimmy said, I have been uh, in full-time ministry for almost 30 years. 
that's actually just changed a little bit, but uh, the 90s, I was a youth pastor and, and did 10 years of youth ministry, working with teenagers and families. And, uh, and then over the last 20 years, I've done college ministry and singles ministry and, and more of a pastoral care type ministry. Uh, led Regeneration at Hope Fellowship, which uh, really is fascinating. I mean, I can use a lot of examples from that of adults and some of their own sexual struggles, how that's affected them as adults and how that started for many of them when they were really young. But uh, I think maybe more important than that, I have raised three kids. Uh, my oldest is is 30, will be 30 in a, in a few weeks. And uh, he was actually uh, on staff at Life Church for years. I'm really proud of my kiddos. Uh, but uh, that's maybe more than anything is, is raising kids and going through this same process that some of you are going through as you're parenting your, your kiddos and trying to figure out how to navigate healthy sexuality and how do you talk to them about pornography and some of these things so and then uh last thing and i'll transition my greatest joy is i'm now a grandfather which is a super cool thing to, to <laughs> nice. A, nice. yeah it's a it's a beautiful thing she's going to be here this week i can't wait to see her and got another one coming in a few months but uh well so guys let me let me let me talk to you a little bit tonight about pornography uh, but so I'm going to give you, I've kind of got this divided up in a few areas. I'm going to start first with, um, you know, Rick Warren's, you know, his big book, The Purpose Driven Life. It, it, it starts with a fascinating sentence, right? It says it's not about you. And there's some, there's, well, there's a lot of truth in that. But over the years, I, I, tweak that a little bit because I believe as adults and, and men and women following Christ, everything starts with you. And if that makes sense, I believe, you know, part of being men and women empowered by the spirit of God is God has given us tremendous responsibility to initially start with our own faith, our own journey in life, uh, but with that idea, when I say everything starts with you, one of the things I have discovered working with uh, a lot of families, working with individuals, working with parents, you know, we really, when we start talking about pornography and we start talking about teaching our children healthy sexuality, it is really important that you and I start with ourselves, and really have some honest dialogue initially, right, with just us and, and God about some of our own views around sexuality and not just our views, but what has impacted our views. Uh, you know, I, I, one of the things we did years ago when I was in youth ministry, uh, we, we started doing a, a true love weights every year. I did that for several years, right? We're trying to, and it was a we take about a month and have these four week series of, of really trying to teach the kids some things about healthy sexuality, uh, kind of God's design and, and how he's created us uh, to be sexual, but also that that's ultimately designed for a marriage relationship. Um, and, and even back then in the 90s, I was very aware I had grown up really, I grew up churched and um, in the small rural little church, but my memory of any conversation about sex was basically sex is bad and stay away from it. Well, that's not true. It, it, it's God's created us as that's part of our, you know, created in his image, male and female, but yet we have this, this desire for sex uh, the, the sexual part of all of us. And so I think it, right, the, as parents raising children, we've got to get honest about our own stuff and what has shaped some of our own views. And right in our, in our marriages, uh, I've done just a ridiculous amount of premarital counseling work over the years and really enjoy that, still do a lot of that. But uh, one of the preparing and rich is one of the different assessments I've used for years. 
And there's a section in there about sexuality. And one of the questions is, are you comfortable talking about sex? And I don't know the exact numbers, but over the years, what I began to see was almost every couple said yes. But then when we began to talk about that in a safe environment, in a, in a counseling room, uh, they really weren't that comfortable talking about it. And, and, and that was always interesting to me. And, and so, again, part of this idea is it's going to be really hard to lead our children well in this area if we personally are having some struggles with it. So I, I just I always kind of want to start there. Uh, but right, the, the whole sexuality thing, the way God's designed us, it really is a big player in our relationships, right? Just the differences. Now, when I say sexuality, right, to, I'm talking about something different than the act of sex, right? Male and female, there's different ways we are wired up uh, that, that affect kind of our sexuality. Um, and, and that's right in our relationships with our, with our parents, our relationships with brothers and sisters, our relationship with friends. Um, and, and so that really is an important part uh, of how God's created us. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important uh, to kind of be reminded and to remember that. Uh, but, but let, me, let me kind of shift gears and talk a little bit about pornography because it's fascinating uh, today. And again, I'm, I just turned 57. So, you know, I, well, I can't remember the exact, it was what in the, when the internet actually hit real time and everybody started carrying an iPhone and having their computers. When I was growing up, if you wanted to get access to pornography, I would have had to have walked into a, um, you know, 7-Eleven or whatever. I remember being in those stores, right? And you see the pornography back behind the, the counter, but I would have had to stood there and said, hey, let me, you know, I need this. And they would have had to pull that out, hand it to me, and I would have had to pay for it. Well, I was the kind of kid growing up, there was no way <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. Now, some kids would have, right? But, but there was no way I was going to go ask for somebody to get uh, pornography and, and then pay for that and walk out of a, a place. Now, I remember, it's, it's interesting, and, and think about this. I think most people can tell you the first time they saw pornography. And, and I do remember I was with my cousins, there were four or five of us, we we're with my grandmother, we're in Ash Grove, Missouri, we're in a grocery store, and grandma's getting some stuff and we're messing around. And right now, my memory was one of my cousins pulled one of those out. And I remember though, you know, I'm eight or nine years old, and I just remember this sense of like, I don't think we're supposed to be looking at this. But right, that still that kind of, it, I just, my memory of that is as much as I can remember, I just felt very frozen. Like I didn't know what to do in that moment. And I remember my grandma walking up behind us and, and kind of saying, hey kids, put that away. You're not supposed to be looking at that. And she didn't make a huge deal out of it, but, but right, it, but it's so different today. Uh, those of us, you know, in our 50s for sure, and, and probably even 40s, that first experience with pornography would have been a magazine. Now, you take our kids today, they're not looking at pornography in a magazine. I mean, maybe some of them are, but it's on a screen. It's on their phone. You know, they say today there are over 40 million porn sites on the internet, uh, right? They, they're saying that, um, now think about this, right? And I don't, I, I found this in multiple places that 25% of all internet searches are related to some type of, they're related to porn or sex. Now think about that, 25% of all searches Guys, that's amazing numbers. Um, 
but 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 then also right these numbers say 64 percent so over half of 13 to 24 year olds are actively looking for pornography now again right these numbers a lot of the research you see today and i'm a research guy i'm fascinated with it but i also believe right there's a little play in all of it there's some really good research and there's some really bad research but again I, I think this research would support the idea that there are a lot of young men and women that are actively looking uh, for some type of sex-related pornography or sexual information on the internet. And guys, for again, for us as parents, we didn't grow up like that. That's a very different dynamic. And it's important that we understand, right? I'm looking for my phone. These phones, I better be careful what I, well, there's nothing bad on there, but I might have somebody's name on there you don't need to see. These phones, right, our children, very young, I'm telling you, if your child has a phone and they have some free access to it, they've probably come across some pornography. That's just the reality. Um, so, um, so just a, a few other numbers real quick, but, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting said 71% of teens are hiding, they're hiding their, their online behavior. So I'm going to suggest that's not just with pornography and that's something to think about too. And, and we'll talk about that a little more in a minute, but if, if you are giving your child just free access to the internet, uh, they're looking at a lot of stuff, right? More than just pornography stuff that they really don't need to be looking at. But, but here's the challenge. As these kids are kind of experiencing this, it really is affecting them psychologically. And it, it really is, is, there's some sexual effects on it as well. Um, and I, I'm going to get into a little more of that in a minute, but, but it's absolutely giving them some very skewed ideas about the reality of sex. Um, now, think about this. Now, I was this way. Um, now, it's funny as, as we age that changes some, but certainly as a teenager, there's some natural curiosity, right? There's sexual curiosity. That's not a bad thing. That's a natural thing. But again, if I have pretty much free access to the internet, man, that's a little dangerous because now I can go pursue all of these different things uh, for that uh, uh, sexual curiosity. Now, another thing that this pornography does that, that I think one of the really negative things is it really perpetuates uh, some really unhealthy uh, sexist views. Um, I mean, pornography is not, it's not real in the sense that it creates a lot of really unhealthy uh, dynamics. And, uh, but, but here's a big idea. Uh, and this kind of gets more into my, my mental health uh, idea. And this is important that you understand this. So what, what pornography does, it, it, it really does affect the brain. And so, right, there's a lot of different things that do this, but pornography would be one of those things that if a child if any of us get on the internet and we're looking at sexual content, pornography, it really does, it gives us a dopamine hit or a release of dopamine in our brain. Now think about this. This is a big thing for me in my counseling work. Um, you are not your brain. Now your brain is part of you, but you also, it's really important to understand we actually have the ability to control our brain, but it's really easy to let our brain be in control. And, and think about this for just a second. 
your brain is really not a, a moral, uh, it's not about right and wrong. The natural brain really is about just protecting and keeping us safe. And so, right, the, if you, you talk about the, the mind and the body and the spirit, right, there's a spirit in each of us. And ideally, as believers, the Holy Spirit, right, that's part of God's design to help us focus on what is true, what is good, what is right, what is best for us. But, but I think you can probably relate to this, right? Our brain does not, it's not always in agreement with that. And so there's part of us that really are trying to uh, understand I have control of my brain. I have control of my thoughts. I have control of my desires. I have, these are things I'm in control of. But again, if I let my brain be on autopilot, it will gladly take control and lead me into things that I don't need to be doing. And so part of that is that dopamine release. The brain's like, hey, this is great. The brain likes that. And so, and this is where it gets tricky. It doesn't take too many times of that happening on a consistent basis that the brain's like, hey, let's get some more porn. That's great. I get this dopamine release, release. It feels good. But then what you also begin to see is I've worked with people over the years, your, your soul, your spirit doesn't feel good. Uh, it starts to really struggle with that. So, so there is this physiological thing that happens, which is concerning. You know, I'm, I'll talk here at the end a little bit about if we talk about true porn addiction, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll define that a little bit, but that's kind of what happens, right? The brain at some point, it, it starts to kind of take over and uh, it really will uh, kind of take us in a really unhealthy, ungodly direction if we don't stay in control of that. Uh, and kids are going to naturally struggle with that, right? I mean, that's part of why our children still need parenting is they're, they're still, listen, think about this, right? I've, 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 I've got this picture of my granddaughter that I'm looking at right here. Children are egocentric. That's just their natural state. They are egocentric. Everything's about them. And you think about your children as you are raising them part of what we're trying to do is to get our children to understand everything's not about you. And, and so kids naturally struggle with that. Teenagers struggle with that. That's a whole nother topic. It seems culturally today, it's taking uh, young adults a little longer to be less egocentric. But again, uh, the use of pornography really taps into that egocentric somehow I'm taking care of myself, but it's taking care of myself in some really unhealthy ways. So I do think, you know, I mentioned just the volume of pornography in, in our culture today. It, it's, it, it, we're so, it's so accessible. And think about this just a little bit. Um, because I, I think part of, well, so think about, it. there is some natural, the way God has created us, that uh, there, there's an interest in, in sex, an interest in, in sexual things, that, that's not odd, or it's not uh, off base, uh, but, but think about it, that's I think that's part of why, if you look at marketing today, for example, it's crazy to me that we're gonna, right? It seems like everything somehow gets sexualized. And why is that? I mean, why would a Drano commercial or right, all these silly commercials that they use some very attractive woman who usually doesn't have a lot of clothes on and, and even will, hint or kind of sexualize something. You think, well, what's that about? Why do they do that? I think, well, it's, it's because there's this natural 
tendency that we have to be curious, to be drawn to these sexual things. But again, part of uh, being children of God, part of our maturing in our faith is, is understanding, wait a minute, th that's not, it's a good thing, but there's a place for that. There's a way we live that out as children of God in healthy ways for us, for our children, for our, our friends. Uh, but there, there is this natural interest in sex. And, and this is important that as parents, part of our job is to help our kids understand that, right? I mean, um, it, it's, we, we need to help them understand that, that this, the sex and the curiosity and the desire for that, it's not bad, it's not evil, doesn't mean you're a bad person, but we've got to help them understand there's a healthy way to live that out. We've got to help them understand God has a design for that. And when we follow his design and his plan, then it's, it's really this beautiful thing that we get to share in the context of marriage. And think about in, in marriage, the risks, there's all these risks that are very prevalent when, when people are sexually active outside of marriage those risks go away in the context of a marriage. But uh, man, we have got to help, we've got to have healthy conversations with our kids about sexuality. But again, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep kind of emphasizing this. If we have some hangups with it, if we've got some unresolved stuff in our past that we've never really worked through, it's going to make it very hard for you to have a healthy dialogue with your children. Um, it, it's fascinating. You know, I always have to be careful telling stories about my children. I, I don't mind telling stories about me, but uh, I remember one of my kiddos, this was years ago, on one Saturday, right? My wife comes down and she has found a, a used condom in the trash can when she's kind of cleaning up the rooms upstairs and she was kind of freaking out now right now i'm i really and that now i can tell you stories where i freaked out and didn't do a good job as a parent but that was a situation i thought okay wait a minute it would not be odd at all for a teenage boy to get a hold of a condom and to experiment with that and so i said hold on a second because, you know, she's thinking he had somebody, I'm thinking, well, there, I don't know when he would have had somebody upstairs. We, we kind of take a pretty good job of that. I said, let me talk to him. And so, you know, we kind of got our day going and I had to go run some errands. And I said, hey, you know, to, to the son that I said, why don't you go with me? And then I think I'll run a few errands, but let's go, go with me. Because I'm thinking, you know what, we'll get in the car, we're driving. It's usually a pretty good space to talk a little bit. So, you know, we got in the car and we started driving and I just said, I said, hey man, your mom's cleaning your room. She found a condom that had been used and we're a little concerned about that. Um, and I could tell right immediately, you can see him like, oh, you know, but again, he can't jump out of the car while we're driving. And, but we began to talk about that a little bit. And in that situation, I was able to say to him like, son, I get, I understand right? There's some curiosity about that. And, and you didn't do something evil or wrong, right? But, but it really created an opportunity for her, he and I to, to really have some dialogue about that. And, and so, uh, but again, if, if we've got a bunch of hangups ourselves, it's really hard to be in those situations. I'm going to talk a little bit here in a minute about when we are trying to talk to our kids about this, some real key components of that. So, so I'll hit some of those in just a minute. Um, but, but right, we want to teach our kids I, I, that, that sex is this beautiful thing God's given us. And, and when it's used well, when we honor it, it it's, it's something that we get to share in a marriage that is, is a beautiful thing. Right, but think about it. 
if what I see this all the time too, in, in my counseling work, I see couples who've come in and if you or I grew up in a religious system or in a home that just basically said, sex is bad, sex is bad, sex is bad, then we get married. Well, sometimes it's hard to shift that mindset to, oh, well, now I'm married and sex is good, right? So again, we, we need to have healthy dialogue with our children about sexuality. And guys, it can't be once, right? I'm not talking about, hey, we're going to meet with our kid one time. We're going to talk about it. We've got to find some natural ways for that dialogue and that conversation to come up. And, and tr well, you know this, right? I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for that to come up. I mean, again, sexual themes, sexual ideas, sexual images, they are everywhere in our modern world. And we've got to be intentional about finding times to have some dialogue with our kids about that. Because Todd, I think you bring up a good point. The idea of culture is going to talk to our kids about sex and they're going to communicate um, their truth of what sex is. And so it's almost like we're, we have a, we're competing with other voices. And yeah. so, and, and I think if we, if we abdicate our role, then there's going to be a society who's just more than glad or, you know, more than happy to fill that role. Yeah, absolutely. And Jimmy, that, I love the way you said that, right? Because here's the reality. We are, I mean, there's a, there's a dialogue going on in our culture every day. And, and if we don't have a voice in that, man, our kids are getting educated, trained, taught, uh, in a lot of really unhealthy ways, absolutely. And, and guys, part of what I've experienced with, with these kiddos in, in my counseling work, right? Pornography also begins to be a way for them to really, in unhealthy ways, deal with uh, just a lot of the negative feelings they're having, uh, you know, the anger, loneliness, rejection, depression, anxiety, um, right? Because again, our kids are naturally dealing with some of that. We all deal with some of that. But again, if they don't have healthy ways to deal with it, for a lot of them, pornography becomes this escape place, right? Think about this because there's there's a lot of things that we do this. It's not always pornography, uh, right? A lot of it is just social media. Listen, a lot of adults struggle with this, right? If I'm just kind of out of it, I'm not really in a good place. I can go get lost in, in just social media stuff. We do it with food. We do it with all kinds of things. Again, that's not necessarily bad, but it's not designed to help us navigate and manage negative feelings and anger and loneliness and rejection and depression and anxiety. And yet a lot of kids will begin to kind of use pornography to help with that. But then what the, the, the horrific thing is the use of pornography tends to create more of those negative feelings, right? It kind of creates this fantasy world that they get lost in that's not real and ultimately does not really give them some of the, the some healing, uh, you know, that they really need. Um, and I'm honestly, guys, think about this. The more we live in a fantasy world, really the bigger your problems become. So if our kiddos are kind of using pornography as a way to deal with some of the negative stuff going on in their lives, they're getting caught up in some of these fantasies. Uh, it's really just creating more problems for them. It doesn't work. Um, so, so let me, so here's, here's some thoughts on how do you talk to your kids about pornography? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging, right? It, it is kind of challenging. It really is. But there really are some things that are super helpful. Pretty basic, some of them pretty basic, but just because they're basic doesn't mean they're easy. Uh, so here's a few ideas. I'm gonna suggest it, it is vital 
that you stay calm, right? Now think about that. Um, one of the things, you know, I, I'm, I love to read and, and kind of have to be careful. I can get interested in too many different things, but I've always been fascinated with some of the different leadership things and different things around it. But years ago, this whole idea of emotional IQ really popped up more in kind of a leadership world. But I think emotional IQ in my work and my counseling work is huge. And so when I talk about emotional IQ, right, I'm talking about having the ability when something kind of triggers us, right, it, it, you kind of get these feelings, these emotions that we have, we have that ability to pause and kind of let our mind go, okay, wait a minute, right? And, and, and we're able to regulate that emotion and not let it get too out of hand. And, and that is vital if we're going to have good dialogue with our kids around pornography, right? They, well, it's anybody, but certainly our kids, they, they really do interpret a lot based on just how they see us reacting uh, and, and kind of responding to things. So and I'm, I, I keep emphasizing this, this is back to my, right? I've got to be honest and good with my own stuff if I'm going to really be able to sit down and deal with other people with some of their stuff, right? And so um, this is why our own kind of sexuality and, and our own processes and that and being in a healthy place is so vital because if that gets triggered, I'm not going to be able to sit down with my child and have a good calm uh but, but then the other thing that really is important, right? So I'm, I'm calm. And then secondly, I want to be able to ask questions, right? That's really helpful. I think sometimes as parents, um, we, we want to quickly start telling them stuff, right? We, uh, you know, what they tend to hear is us preaching at them. And so if, if we can really in a, stay calm and ask some questions, right? It's, it's, it's one of my favorite. I'm a huge fan of Stephen Covey's work, right? The seven habits of highly effective people. This is so important, right? Seek first to understand, then be understood. Do not assume that when you hear or find out your child is using pornography, that you totally understand why you get it. You know, everything that's going on with them. Don't start there. Start more from, hey, man, what's going on? Talk to them, you know, ask some questions about it. Uh, try, to, try to ask questions so that you can better understand what's going on with them. Uh, a third thing, and, and guys, this is so important, right? This would be more than just pornography, but this is in, in my world, I think in, in the counseling work, I've just seen this more and more. Do not shame your children if you are talking to them about pornography. And listen, it's very easy to do, but think about this. This is one of, I see this, and, and honestly, I've maybe seen this more in my ministry work than my counseling work. But I see so many people that really struggle with shame. You think about this, right? Guilt and shame, they have some similar properties, but they really have a different function. Guilt is a good thing for me to experience a little guilt that, that motivates me to change a behavior and do something different, right? And guilt is just this sense of, ugh. That wasn't right. That wasn't good. That's not what I need to do. I need to do this. Shame is not so much I did something wrong. Shame has much more of a, a belief that I'm wrong. Something's wrong with me. And so I'm telling you, kiddos that are using pornography, they're struggling with a lot of shame already. And, and, and the tragedy about shame is shame really 
encourages us to keep things even more hidden. And that's the last thing we want when we are working with someone around pornography. So if you're going to shame your children for using pornography, you're just going to drive them more into the shadows and you're going to encourage them to hide it even more. So I just, I want to encourage you, right? Don't shame them. Now there, so think about this. Now I th I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer, right? I think God models this beautifully because uh, I don't believe God shames us. Uh, but, but I think one of the things I see beautiful about God is God absolutely uh, lets us know that, hey, you have a choice and your choice has consequences, right? That's a, that's a, that's a reality. And, and so, right, in the progression, as you are talking to your kids, right, at some point, help them begin to understand, hey, you have some choices here and your choices can have some consequences but but that's just a great thing to learn right in, in moving them into adulthood uh and and so but if we start more from a shaming perspective we just really lose the ability to teach them that hey um you have a choice and your choices have consequences. And so again, but then a, a fourth thing, right? So be calm, ask questions, don't shame. And then a fourth thing is educate them, help them better understand kind of the significance of pornography, how it affects people, right? Help them understand kind of that chemical, uh, and you look at dopamine, Right, I, I'd help them understand again, this is just for me, this is a big deal. This was a big thing with my children. I wanted my children to understand, right? That, that sex is a really cool thing. It's a beautiful thing, but it's, it's designed for a marriage relationship, right? And, and so part of the educating, help them understand God's design for this. Right? What's why? Why does God want us to have the 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 sex be part of our marriage relationship? But right, help them understand a, a biblical perspective on it. Uh, help them understand mentally what it kind of does. Uh, so uh, you know, educate them, uh, and then right, uh, kind of last thing here is then really discuss with them about some boundaries and safeguards, right? Now, and again, guys, think about this. Sometimes when I'm working with uh, people, right? I may, I may in my mind think, okay, we got to get you here, but I want them to kind of get there. And then I kind of jump on that and support them and encourage them like, yeah, that's a great idea. What would that, right? And kind of, so, when, when you talk about kind of discussing some boundaries and safeguards, again, I'm going to advocate, try to kind of ask them first, like what, what would help you with this, right? What maybe would be some things that we could do that would help you if you're struggling with pornography and, and first see if they come up with some ideas that really are workable. If that, right. If that makes sense. Um, if we just immediately jump in and start putting all of these things down, right? And at some point you may need to do that. But again, I'm talking about a progression, right? Of initially, I want to have them have some part of a process of saying, okay, what can we do that's going to help give you some better boundaries, that, that's going to give you some safeguards? Um, now, guys, think about this. And, and, Man, I just see, I wish more and more families had some time frame at the end of the night where we put our electronics away. I mean, there's so many layers to this. Uh, I see so many people that struggle with sleep, um, that uh, struggle with anxiety, that struggle with all these different things. And one of the things I see consistently today is people are on their electronics all through the night, 
right? And, and so part of this, now again, this is important as a family because I, I think if, if everybody else in the family is on their phones all night long and we're taking one kid and saying, hey, you can't have your phone, uh, right? But again, this is some kind of almost getting to some other things, but I guess I'm, I'm encouraging you, right? Especially as kids are younger, to really establish, man, there's a time we check our electronics in because we're going to transition. We're going to get ready for bed and we're going to sleep and we're going to get some rest. So these kiddos are spending a ridiculous amount of time on their phones all through the night. And it's not always pornography, but it's all kinds of different stuff that really is not good for them. So, but right, finding, you know, some different ways in your family Right. And again, the idea is not always just focusing on them, but just saying as a whole, here's some things we're going to do as a family to be healthier. And we're going to shut things off at a certain time and everybody's going to check in their stuff and we're not going to all be on electronics all through the night. Uh, right. There's some different firewall things that you can put on phones to uh, kind of protect some of that and, and some. Uh, but again, really have some discussion with them about boundaries and some safeguards. Um, and so, so, so let me, let me shift gears just a little bit real quickly here and, and talk about, so here are some things, right? If, if maybe you have a child and you're concerned about this, right. And, or you're thinking, ah, they may be, I don't really know. Um, but, but here's some things that, that I think kind of are things to look for and to kind of begin to be aware of, uh, because here's really what pornography does, right? It, it really starts to give kids an unrealistic, uh, unrealistic uh, kind of sexual beliefs and values. So, right, so that might be something, you know, if you, you sense some things or hear some things, um, it also is going to create an over focus, more of an obsession around sex and sexual things, uh, right? It's going to promote a lot of that. It's going to promote some sexually aggressive behaviors. So, right, you might pick up if, if right, again, if, if kids are getting in trouble for something at school, uh, or maybe you've seen some texts that's like, okay, that's a little over the line, out of bounds. But if you're seeing some patterns of these things, um, you know, um, it, now again, if you're seeing some promiscuity, right? Promiscuity where they're just, you know, you're picking up some things about the way they're dressing, the way they're doing some things. It's like, eh. Um, and, then, and then here's some really unhealthy things. Well, all these are, but... But I think this is a big idea, especially on the female side, because that is one of the things we're seeing today is a much higher percentage of females. This really used to be more of a male concern, but it, today uh, I have seen a lot of uh, young adult women in the last several years who struggle with this. But one of the things that it's really detrimental to, to young women is it really gives them some negative views about their own body or, right? And, 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 and that's true on the, the male side too. So it can just really cause some questions and doubts uh, about their own body. Um, and, and again, you know, it, it can create some depression stuff. It can create some anxiety. Uh, you're typically, if, if someone truly has a pornography addiction, uh, you're going to start to see some relationship challenges with parents, with friends. They're going to start to be a lot more isolated. Uh, they're going to be spending a lot more time alone. Um, and, and so, um, you know, part of, again, part of the education process is really helping them see that Right? If they are struggling with any of this, just being silent and not talking to anybody about it, that, that doesn't work. I mean, it's not helpful at all. Um, 
um, you know, the, the pornography stuff, the, the, when you start seeing more of the addiction thing, um, it, it's part of why it becomes an addiction is because it is so unfulfilling. It really doesn't meet any true needs. It, and it, it just creates um, just a lot of unfulfilled needs. Um, uh, it also, and, and this is a huge deal, really just with pornography and a lot of our sexual uh, marketing and media today, is it really turns, you know, young people that are using pornography, they're really turning into a consumer of people, right? It's, it's, it's just teaching them to use people uh, in, an, in a really unhealthy way. Um, and, uh, but you do tend to see, again, more isolation, uh, especially right at home. If you've got a kiddo that's just in his room or her room all the time, it's hard to get them out of their room, but they've got computer phones in there. It's like, that's may not be pornography, but there's something going on where they're kind of um, leaning into and then guys the, the porn really does it just creates a lot of shame um, and and the the shame just fuels more porn use which is a really tragic cycle um, but uh, so real quickly and then we'll take have a few minutes here if there's some questions uh, this is kind of a helpful Patrick Carnes, Dr. Patrick Carnes has got some really good stuff around some sexual um, unhealthy, you know, addictive things around sexuality. But but here are kind of because I do hear people sometimes say, right, even if it's them saying I have a porn addiction or my kid has a porn addiction. And sometimes I start interact, you know, working with them. So, OK, it's not an addiction. It's a problem. But but it's. But, but addictions, here's some things that you kind of begin to see. Um, is there absolutely is just a preoccupation with just a lot of focus on uh, kind of sexual behavior, pornography, and, and you're starting to see some compulsive behaviors uh, around that of, of getting access to it, where they're just finding a lot of time and start creating circumstances where they can be alone and, and get access to uh, pornography. Um, the other thing is you really do see what kind of a ritualization uh, idea. So they really create some routines uh, around looking at pornography. Uh, and again, that just starts to be more consistent over time. Um, and then they really kind of tied to that ritualization, uh, they really do start losing some control of, uh, of stopping the behavior. Um, and, but, but one of the tricky, one of the things that again is a component to this is when they start adding the masturbation with the pornography, that just again what that does mentally and to the brain it really engages the brain with some you know dopamine and some other kind of natural hormone releases that just kind of create a deeper bond and connection to the pornography so you know kind of that third thing is they just really start to lose some some control and they're really not able to stop um, and then kind of that fourth thing is it just really gets pretty unmanageable and they really do start to feel a lot of despair, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of powerlessness, like, uh, because I do, I see people that really say they want to stop, but they just really struggle stopping. Uh, so, right, again, calling it an addiction uh it's like well it, it sometimes it's an addiction but again sometimes it's just an unhealthy behavior that that teenagers really need some help and some support uh to to really uh you know work through that so again maybe i'll the 
you know, when would you seek professional help? Maybe I'll stop with that, right? So if you really do notice some behavior change, you really start to notice maybe some depression, some anxiety. Um, if, if you notice the type of porn that they're looking at uh, is, is kind of getting more intense, more extreme. Um, if you really start to notice that that pornography is interfering with just some of their daily life interests, right? Where it's school, family, friends, chores, uh, you know, if you if you picking up just some a lot of lying behavior around it, right? Sometimes parents they have access, they kind of realize what the kids are looking at, uh, but the kids will still lie and deny that. Um, and and tr two, if if you're just seeing some relationship changes, right, where they're just not as connected as they have been. Uh, with key people in their lives. That usually means something's going on. It may not be porn, but something they're struggling with. And then again, if, if you get a kid who says, and I, I have some I work with, right, who just say, I can't stop. Like, I want to stop and I can't. It's like, okay, that's probably a good time to get a, a professional involved that can kind of start doing some work with them to help them work through that process. So, that's, uh, I know that's a lot of information. I hope some of that's helpful. Um, and we've got a few minutes if there's some questions, Jimmy, that I'm happy to, to jump in and yeah. respond to. Are there any um, books, Todd, or resources that you would recommend for parents to kind of have these intentional discussions or, or, to, or to talk about all this? Yeah, and you know, I should have made a list um, of some. Um, because I you I just have all these different um, I'll tell you what let let me you know I mentioned Dr. Patrick Carnes he's got some really good stuff um, I'm trying to I, I've got a lot of my other stuff at my my counseling office um, because the, part of the challenge is you see more of this more of the printed stuff is more for adults. Right. And, and not as much for, for kids. So um, that's something I could absolutely send you. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Just work up that list and I can email it to the participants here. Absolutely. Um, if you feel, if you, um, if you feel like someone, you, you mentioned the addiction and you feel like they're, they're addicted. I mean, what, what do you, the, the question is, how do you help them break out of it? And, and I guess part of what you answered, your answer were there was to, to, just to seek professional help, but would you expound on that any more or say any more to that? Yeah. So, so I think, I think the idea, so when I, professional help is, is sometimes a very good option, but I think too, right, it, having some additional support, I think that's right again, because as parents, our support is vital, but I, I mean, I've experienced this as a pastor and as a therapist, uh, and even just as a friend, right, of, of where if we can get kind of the idea of some community around those kids when they're struggling, because you, they just need to hear some different voices as long as we know, right, we're trying to get them connected with people that are going to absolutely not shame them and really encourage them and, and, and give them some support and ideas of ways to kind of manage it, right? So, I almost think about sometimes it's, you know, it's like kind of almost having a team of some coaches, mentors around them that, you know, are know what's going on, but also are going to love them and accept them and really encourage them, um, you know, give them some support. Yeah. Um, a lot of times parents ask about tools as far as, you know, monitoring phones my, at things at home. What are some of the ones in your experience that you've had that you seem to be the most? I, know, I realize kids can get around anything, but just have yeah. been some of the most effective uh, in your practice and in and, yeah. and, and your research and study. Well, and man, you, you just hit a big... I'm fascinated what kids, they're really smart. You know, some of us, I mean, I'm sure some of these adults that are listening are maybe very savvy on, you know, technology. I'm really not, but I'm just fascinated at 
what people tell me in a counseling room of how they got around something or how they avoided something or how they found something. So, right. I think one, I just think as parents, you need to have access to your kids' phones, right? I, I think you have to be careful of, of being on that all the time, but I think they need to know that you have access to their phones and that periodically you're kind of just, right? Not, not just snooping and not just digging in, but every now and then you kind of look at a few things. Um, there is, um, man, what is the name of that? Um, I just went blank on a, um, there's a, oh, I may have to send you that too. I should have written all that down. Of um, There are a couple of good, um, you know, uh, online deals that kind of, and actually, there's a good thing for a kid to have sometimes, right? I, a lot of my men, I use this. I don't know why I'm just blank on the name of it. Uh, but right, you give. So it's sending, you know, your... Um, oh, covenant eyes? Yeah, covenant. Yes, that's one of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Covenant eyes, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and honestly, I just... There's some of this stuff, right? I, I'm a big fan in our homes... Like my wife has every, the only thing she does not have access to is my counseling logs, right? She cannot get on that, but she has every password I own or have access to, right? And I do think there's some level of that in our homes, but that's a good thing to do. Even if we're not checking it all the time, but just, right, it's one of those healthy boundaries that, that we just know, hey, if we have a concern, we can get on and look at something because again, that if, if I know my wife has access to every, you know, my iPad, my, my phone, my computer, well, you're going to think about what you're looking at, where you're going on your computer. Again, we, she trusts me. She doesn't look at my, but it's just some good accountability. So man, I'm a fan of, yeah, the covenant eyes is one of them. I don't know why I'm thinking, it seems like there's another one. Um, but I'm just blank as a wall on it, but same thing, right? It's just one of those deals that it's going to send whoever you've listed your searches and, and what you're looking at, they're going to get mm -hmm. a, a copy of that. So yeah. I think that's valuable. Yeah. You, you mentioned that sometimes kids go to pornography to cope, you know, what, what are, what do you see? What are they? What are they coping from? I mean, what, what are they trying to deal with? A lot of times in, in your practice, what are they? What are they trying to run from? So, right, kid. Part of what kids are trying to figure out is right how to date, how to connect with. Right, what are some healthy ways to interact with the opposite sex? And right, and and again, there's so many perspectives about that that really are just goofy so I think you you know you get a lot of kids that think well I'm never gonna be that guy so right they get discouraged about that or I'm never gonna be that girl that's attractive and the guys are gonna be interested in so it can almost just become this escape to right it's like I'm never gonna experience this in any good way so I'll just kind of again some curiosity I'll go explore this but I think too, right? It's there's just a lot of ways when we're struggling, right, with with it, and that's kind of the danger, right? Alcohol, food, pornography, some of these things. It, when people are using that, they do numb out a little bit. But the problem is when they come back to, then they feel worse about what they did. So it creates this cycle. So, but I do think for a lot of kids, kids are struggling today with anxiety and depression and some different things. And so it's kind of this false, you know, this feels better to go do this and it can feel good in a moment, but then it just creates more shame and frustration and just keeps that cycle going. Right. I, lo I love what you said about the shame aspect. And that's such a huge thing because I, I, we talk with, or I get to talk with parents a lot and 
And I, I try to tell parents that it's important to, to normalize what they just did, right? Not to, because I think a kid already freaks out a little bit, especially if it's a, like a first time exposure to it or they've done something to it. But yeah. I, I like your emphasis on explaining that, that, okay, this is okay. Don't freak out. I mean, obviously brown, boundaries and this is not where we want to go. Yeah. And also just the fact that you, you talked about a lot of talking about the good, the good that sex is right. Yes. It's not bad. And, and, and how to frame that in, in, in a positive light. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cause well, I did think go ahead. to challenge, you know, that's a challenge. Again, if you've grown up in a home or in a church, you know, that sex is bad, sex is bad, sex is bad. Then you get married and all of a sudden, it's hard to separate that. I really do work with a lot of couples where someone has just been taught sex is bad, but now I'm married and it's, they, it's hard for them to switch the, you know, the, mm -hmm. or that turn that switch on to go well, wait. It's okay. Now it's actually good now. So right. yeah, absolutely. That's good. Well, man, I appreciate we're out of time. I appreciate you taking right. uh, taking this time to be with us and uh, parents. Uh, thank you for joining with us. We're actually going to, show that we're gonna, uh, we've recorded this and we're gonna put it on our on our stuff, our social media so you can share it with your other parents. And I know Todd is is uh, um, is a counselor and someone that you can call uh, and contact with. And also I know he, if he can't see you, I don't know what his schedule is like, he can definitely refer you to people who can help you. So Todd, again, thanks so much uh, for being with us tonight. Yeah, enjoy, appreciate All right. it. Thanks everyone, y'all have a great evening. Yep.